Hello again, it's Tubal Kane, your YouTube shop teacher, and this is episode number 45 of my This and That series, and I've got several things to show you, some viewer appreciation gifts, and uh, some other interesting items, I think. So let's start out with a uh, Sterrett micrometer. Now recently, Adam Booth showed a micrometer that was given to him, and this might even be his hand here, I'm not sure, but it's a Sterrett number 204, and the unique thing about this one is it's quick acting. Now I've never seen one of these in all the years I've been in the business, but really what it allows you to do here is if you have to move your micrometer all the way from one end to the other, instead of this business, you can push the little button here and slide the, uh, the, the thimble back and forth. Now it must have been either a failure as far as the way it worked, or uh, troublesome or something because they apparently took it off the market but here's another picture of it that I found on the internet that was one of the advertising pictures that's an older one because it's not uh, satin chrome and there's yet another picture but you push that little button where his forefinger is And along that same line, and I know you're getting sick of hearing about the Peterson product teaching aid here, but when I made these, uh, you know, many years ago, made 10,000 of them, someone asked me, does it actually screw in and out? And yes, there is a screw in there, and you can rotate it to get your settings. But also there was a me mechanism in there, it's spring-loaded, that allowed the teacher to quickly move that thimble in and out, and it made a wa -da 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 sound as it moved. So I guess I invented that uh, myself. <clears throat> as I mentioned in an earlier video, I was recently in Louisiana, and here we are in New Orleans with Don and Ruth Snyder, who hosted us and just gave us a grand time. But Don there makes candy from time to time. Maybe Ruth does too, I don't know, but Don made me a beautiful batch of divinity fudge. Let me show you that. Yes, he made me that huge batch. Actually, actually, I believe it's four batches of divinity fudge. Now, divinity fudge is one of the most difficult fudges or candies to make, uh, known to mankind. It's very subject to failure, but he did a magnificent job on this, and uh, but I ate virtually all of it. You see, it's a week later, and this is all that's left, and now I'm rationing it to myself because it's so good. And as it gets older, it gets a very light crust on it that is just excellent, and he packed it full of pecans. And generally, people chintz on pecans because they cost so much, but it's just packed full of them. And again, it's got that little crust on Now, if you ever buy Peeps, that uh, Easter candy, little chickens, you know, they're no good when they're fresh. You have to take them out of the package and age them just a little bit so they get that tempered crust on them. So uh, thank you, Don, so much for making that candy for me. In the last episode of this series, I showed you a little flashlight that I had, and this is not the same one. I threw it away. It still works, but it didn't work when I first took it out. It was in one of my storage cabinets as a dedicated flashlight. It didn't work when I opened the cabinet. So I banged it around and it worked. And then I thought, well, I better check the batteries. Well, I had to take a pliers again to open that. And then looking inside, look, look at the corrosion, see? Now, I know you people are thinking I'm whining about this, but I'm going someplace with this story. And uh, actually, there's two Two things I want to show you here besides this. And, you know, when somebody said, clean this out with vinegar, well, I'm just going to throw it away. Let's, well, let's see what kind of batteries these are. So we, they're, again, they're those energizers that are supposed to last forever. Okay. Uh, but I had told you that I was brokenhearted as a kid when I was 10 years old because Mrs. Hurst gave me a Roy Rogers flashlight for Christmas. Well... Of all things, I get this package in the mail from Sam Schublum, and he's the same man that gave me that wonderful little camera on drill press. But he said, look what I got for you. So there it is, very similar. This is a modern repro, no doubt, because it's plastic here, but the originals would have been metal. And I told you that mine had a siren on the end. Well, this even has... 
a little <laughs> siren on. Now this one's all plastic so it won't corrode from saliva, but uh, now I can relive, <laughs> relive my childhood. Thank you, Sam. And of course Roy was a hero of mine. Now most people have never even heard of him. So in that recent video, I had this package of energizers that I was talking about. You know, I didn't even notice it. I just had them forever. They're still in the package, but notice that they were expired by the year 2002. Well, that's, uh, what, uh, 16, 17 years ago. And uh, they're still not corroded, even though they're energizers. But I had no idea they were that old. I must have got these at a auction or something, but I'm going to open them right now to see if they work. There's my battery tester. Can you believe that? That these are going on 20 years old? If they expired by 02, that means they were made two or three or four years before that. Two in a row. I won't test the other one, but I assume they probably work. So there in my criticism of Energizer batteries, and I've shown you, I don't know how many that are no good in the package. There's an ancient set that have not leaked. So I guess that's a testimony to the little Energizer bunny. Thanks for bearing with me on that. I know you're sick of hearing about this and it seems so trivial and you're thinking who cares about your cheap Chinese flashlight? Who cares about your Roy Rogers flashlight? It's all so trivial. Well it's not very trivial when your life depends on it. Now let me tell you a short story. Recently I was at the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio and here's one of the displays. This is a survival kit that came out of an airplane and in there there are a few things that might be needed if your plane goes down. Number one, a flashlight and among other things that is a sextant that would allow the stranded aviators to possibly find their way back to civilization. But just one little problem, the batteries had leaked and ruined not only the flashlight but this instrument and there was documentation on uh, the, uh, the sign there, the little notice that uh, explained all of that. So I thought that was interesting and it reminded me of my Roy Rogers flashlight. And you know, years ago, all of those batteries had a paper cover on them because this was Second World War vintage. I recently received a box from Clint Thompson and he says, do you like pickled beets? And he says, I make a pretty mean batch of them. And I said, well, yeah, everybody likes pickled beets. He said, I'll send you some. But I got to build a crate in order to ship it so it doesn't break. So, he said he was going to send some other things along. So there's some batteries. I guess those fit the caliper. I'm not sure. And then, well, it's going to take a minute to get that out. And finally, there they are. Pickled beets from Clint Thompson. Thank you ever so much. I'll have some of those tonight. He's quite a woodworker, too. Look at that box. Smooth as a baby's hind end. Recently I had a five part video on how to make this little double acting wobbler steam engine and uh, Mr. Paul St. Marie made a set of plans for those and here's what they look like. Printed out. There's the engine. Paul St. Marie and there are working drawings are about five pages of them with dimensions that he made up for me and thank you ever so much Paul but let me show you how to find these and they're on Thingiverse of all things these prints are on Thingiverse let's go to the computer okay I'm at the computer and there is that little project I'm talking about there's five parts and it's called Wobbler DA steam engine how to build part one of five there's five parts so check those out. Now I'm on the other screen here and I'm on the Thingiverse site and you know how to find Thingiverse. 
And if you do a search there for Mr. Pete's Double Acting Wobbler, you'll find there, you can even print this out, it's a, uh, here's the engine, but it's on its side, so it looks a little unusual there, but you can download all the files. Thank you again, Paul, for this. Now, I'm going to put a link down in the comments or down in the description for that, but here is Paul's name, so you can look up his Thingiverse items under that, P-S-T-E-M-A-R-I. The other day I got a package, a surprise package from Mr. Jerry Wilson. He lives out in Mule Creek, New Mexico. I like that name. I like mules. That's one of my favorite animals. I don't know why, but in the box. And Jerry uh, was afraid that he too was beating a dead horse because this is some older stuff we're talking about here. But he made yet one more oil can for me. You know, I got a lot of these. But I had complained a little bit about there was no way to get the chips out of some of these oil cans. But here's one made with a can of uh, heat. So you can fill it and you can open it up to clean it out. So that's pretty clever. That's a good idea because the ones made out of uh, tuna cans, you, you know, you can't open them up. Well, also in there is a dial indicator. Now, remember, I think this came from Shars, but remember they were sold out. Somebody blamed me for that. It took them a long time to restock. But in there is a dial indicator. Now, why did he give me this dial indicator? I had a little trouble figuring it out myself. You know, I make, I've made so many videos, sometimes people catch me off guard when they're talking about something. But apparently, I had talked about on this double ender that I wasn't able to get the indicator in close enough. And apparently, here I did drill or mill a hole for that little knob. But what Jerry did with this one, and he gave me this, is that he moved the knob from this side, looks like he plugged the hole and apparently drilled and tapped the hole and moved that screw over to that side so in fact it would be more compact. The whole idea I was trying to make this thing narrow and short on the double ender. So I uh, thank you Jerry for the idea and the indicator and the oil can and, and, and all of that. And this is one of the original oil cans that I made, well, it goes way back to 2013, and some people accused me of killing uh, Smokey the Cat, remember that? <laughs> but Smokey is still alive and well, although he's getting pretty old and feeble looking, but I, I just saw him the other day running through the snow. This video has gotten so long, and there's still at least five minutes more, but this will be the last topic that I cover. The rest will have to be saved for the next edition. But you recall a recent video where I did a test on this old ideal indicator. I compared it to a last word, and it was problematic, and many people saw that the indicator was moving or the mount was moving. So I'm redoing the whole thing, and... I'm going to show you that now, and then that will be the conclusion of this video. There will be no sign-off. The sign-off is right now. So, thanks for watching, but stay tuned for about five more minutes. In a recent video, I did an experiment and a test with this little test indicator, Ideal brand. It's a real old one. And I declared it to be inaccurate, but upon watching the video and watching uh, several of your comments on that, there was a problem. The indicator was either lifting the entire setup, because the spring in there is quite strong compared to a last word, or the indicator was swiveling a little bit on the holder. So I'm redoing the experiment now with quite different results. So I'll make this short, but have a look. And this is the title of the previous video where there was inaccuracies. So you can go back and check that out if you feel like it. In this setup, I have the indicator held in a square bar tightened down securely and held in a rather heavy vise. I initially did it using this first 
this vise and then this vise and it still caused the vise to lift ever so slightly off. So that's how strong that spring is and I think that's where all the inaccuracies occurred. Okay, using gauge blocks and this is a stack here of uh, 700 plus 100 so that's 800 thousands. I'm able to bring it pretty much on zero there. Now I will add Take that one off, and this is 105, so that's five thousandths more. And you can see I'm on five. And the next one is six. Now I know I'm not ringing these together. That's okay. And this is seven. And eight. So each time I'm adding a one thousandth more. This is eight. This is nine. And finally, 10. Now, it's just a little bit off, but then again, when I was on zero, it was just a little bit off. But I would say that this is pretty darn good, but it's, but it's off perhaps a half a thousandth at the most through its full range. So I'm declaring it a pretty accurate instrument. Perhaps not as accurate as the last word. And the problem I see with this indicator is that the spring is so strong that it wants to lift. And it certainly didn't work on, at all with the original little holder here. But I, I then checked the amount of pressure that it took to move a last word and it was much much less. I'd like to do a little experiment with the scale to see how many ounces or grams that it takes to, to lift this. But I'm declaring this a, a good instrument. So that is the correction to that previous video. Hope you enjoyed that little experiment and you can have a lot of fun with the gauge block set.